Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me for today's edition of Arkansas Alive. All this week, I'm teaching on restoration, and I want you to be blessed. I want you to hear what the Scripture says, because if you've suffered any loss of any kind, God is your restorer, and He wants to restore that which you've lost. So stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. <clears throat> I'm also uh, going to be making available to you uh, my latest product, my latest book called Ownership, Who Owns the Earth? The Law of Empowerment. And I'm taking this out of Proverbs chapter 6. I was reading this one day. I'd heard a message preached where if you catch a thief, you make him pay back seven times. And out of that scripture, you know, major uh, teachings have been um, structured and it comes out. The end result is if the devil steals from you, make him pay back seven times what he's stolen. Well, <clears throat> the scripture says, and we read it yesterday, if a man steals because he's hungry, don't despise him. But if he be found, make him pay seven times, uh, sevenfold, excuse me, and he shall give all the substance of his house. Then he goes on and says, Whoso commits adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, and he that doeth it destroys his own soul. So if you tie these two verses together, he's really talking about uh, adultery because if you read the previous verses, uh, he talks about, uh, a hunter will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. And then he goes into the thief, why the thief is stealing. If he's hungry, you don't despise him because he's stealing because he's hungry. But he's talking about adultery. Adultery is a theft. It's stealing from somebody. Uh, it's stealing something that doesn't belong to you. And that's what he is addressing here. And he says, if you commit adultery with a woman, you lack understanding. You'll destroy your own soul. A wound and dishonor will you get, and your reproach will not be wiped away. But out of that, we have developed a teaching that says, if Satan steal from you, make him pay back seven times what he's stolen. Now, we're talking about restoration, and I want you to get the right information. Satan is not going to restore anything to you. He can't. He does not have the ability to restore or create. That comes from God. Every scriptures we've read, it refers to God as the restorer. God's the restorer of the breach. God will restore unto Israel that which the canker worm, the palmer worm. God restored to Job twice what he had stolen. But it didn't come from Satan. It didn't come from the devil. <clears throat> I know this might be contrary to what you've experienced, but if you're hurting, if you've suffered loss, especially during the recent tornado, homes, automobiles, um, anything that you've suffered loss as a result of, of Satan stealing, killing, and destroying. Satan cannot restore anything to you. He doesn't have restoration ability. He doesn't have creative ability. It's not that Satan is the one that is going to restore. It's God is going to restore to you what Satan has taken, what Satan has stolen. And we're going to show you this in the scriptures. And that's what I wanted you to, to get. So if you're hurting, if you're in grief, if you're, uh, you know, suffered loss and you're tormented by it and your joy is gone, rejoice, dear heart. God is your restorer and he will restore everything that you've lost. That's what I want to get across to you. I want to build your faith up and get you to realize there's no reason for the, for the tears and the grief. I know it hurts. It hurts for me when I see the destruction, the devastation. For the people's sake. You know, when we were building our church building, it took several years because we were building it and paying for it as we went. We did not have a loan. 
And so, because that's the way the Lord told us to do it. And it took a lot longer. It was a lot harder. But the people responded and God said, if this body cannot build a building, it can't take a city. And everything was connected. And after a couple of years of building, we took building offerings every Sunday in addition to the tithes. And then we paid the contractors on Monday what, we, what came in on Sunday. And if uh, there was a, a, a span there where I sensed, I could sense the people were tired. They were tired of gilding. And we had, we had work days on Saturdays getting ready for Sunday service because auditorium wasn't finished. We had to move chairs. And so uh, I asked the Lord, I said, and the parking lot needed to be paved because we just had gravel and it was ruining people's shoes and the cars were getting stuck in the mud and it was just <laughs> devastating. So I said, Lord, you told us not to borrow the money for the building, but can I borrow the money to pave the parking lot? I think at that time, that was back in the late 70s, early 80s, it was going to cost $100,000 or more to pave the parking lot. I said, can I borrow the money to pave the parking lot? I said, for this reason, the people are tired. They need a rest. They <laughs> they're tired of working. They're tired of giving. So can I get your permission to go borrow the money to pave the parking lot and then pay it back? And he said, yes, for the people's sake. It's always about people. It's always about God's children, his sons and daughters. So we borrowed the money, paid the parking lot, and I think we paid it back in three months. But if you will consider the people, God is for people. He loves people. And if you love people, you hurt when they hurt. When they suffer, you suffer. And I've been experiencing that over all the devastation, the grief of, of everybody's loss. And so I asked the Lord, what can I do to help them? He said, teach them about my restoration. God is the restorer, not Satan. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the spirit. He doesn't have the creative ability to restore anything. It's God. He said, I will restore, saith the Lord. He told Job, I will give you back twice what you've had before. He told Israel, I will restore what the palmer worm, canker worm ate out of an agricultural society background. So if, if you read Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1, uh, excuse me, Pro Proverbs chapter 6, verse 31, and if you read it correctly, you will see that God is dealing with adultery and he counts it as a theft. He said, it's stealing something that doesn't belong to you. But if he be found, he'll restore sevenfold. And I've already read to you the laws of restitution in Exodus. There were laws of restitution under the old covenant or the first covenant. And those laws required different returns or different restoration for different crimes. Uh, if you stole an ox, if you stole somebody's property, it, blah, blah, blah. It was called the laws of restitution. So he said, if you commit adultery with a woman, uh, you that do it, you'll destroy your soul. And a wound and a dishonor will you get. Your reproach will not be wiped away. But out of this one verse in verse 31, Proverbs 6, 31, we've developed a, uh, a teaching uh, that says to people, if Satan steals from you, make him pay back seven times what he's stolen. Satan cannot pay you back anything. He doesn't have the resources. He doesn't have the heart. He doesn't have the creative ability. He's a thief. He's not going to restore anything. How many in real life, how many thieves do you imagine have ever felt bad about stealing something and bring it back? You, know, you might have heard a testimony, one out of a million but thieves don't have any conscience. <laughs> They're a thief. And God hates a thief. He hates the theft. He loves the person, but he hates the, the spirit of thievery. Satan cannot return anything to you. First of all, where's he going to get it? Where's he going to get the restoration? If he steals 
uh, a house or a car or a child or a, uh, a job. Where, where is he going to get it? He, he doesn't have any creative ability. He can't, he can't replace what he has stolen. He can't restore it. The Bible doesn't teach that he'll restore it. We've misinterpreted that scripture. It says God will restore it. God is your restorer. So you focus on him. He is the one that is going to restore whatever you have lost. Father, I pray for our viewers right now. If there's anybody watching, their families, their uh, neighborhood that have suffered loss, I ask you in the name of Jesus to, to deliver them from the grief, the hurt, the pain, the loss. Deliver them from the hurt of it and restore the joy of their salvation. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Restore the joy of their salvation. Deliver them from depression and oppression. And I pray in Jesus' name and begin the restoration process now to give them back double what they have lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to encourage you with this and I want you to stay tuned all week so we can, uh, you know, embellish on this, enlarge this so you'll get it. Uh, let me read something that the Lord said to me several years ago. He said, I want to restore back to my children. I want to restore back to my sons and daughters that which they've lost. Confidence, trust, jobs, income, homes, land, anything that they have lost. But they will have to believe me to do it and thank me for it. Did you get that? You'll have to believe God to do it, not Satan. You have to believe God to do it and you have to thank him for it. Let's do that right now. I'm suggesting to you that you write down on a piece of paper or your notebook or wherever inside your Bible, everything that you've lost as a result of this tornado and write it down, itemized, item by item and lay hands on it. If you have a prayer partner or a spouse, lay hands on it and begin to thank God for restoring it. He said, if you will believe me to do it and thank me for it, I will restore back to you what you've lost. So Father, we pray together right now. We release our faith. I pray for all of our viewers that are watching now and they lay their hands on that list. I lay my hands on this word from you and I pray to you. They're praying to you. Father, restore that which they have lost. Give them back their joy. Give them back uh, the joy of their salvation. Give them back their goods and bless them with double what they've lost, just like you did Job, give him back twice as much as he had before, twice as much, better, improved, increased. And Father, that goes for VTN too. We pray that you will restore our power, our microwave dish, our towers, our air conditioners, all the things that we lost due to the tornado. We claim double, and we thank you for it because we know it comes from you. And we pray in agreement in Jesus' name, amen. Now, you continue to do that every day, you and your prayer partner, your children, your, uh, your spouse, whoever it is you can get to agree with you according to Matthew 18, 19, and you lay hands on the list and we said, thank you, Father. We just thank you for restoring to us what we've lost. Hallelujah. You're going to get back double double the value, double the item, whatever it is, you're going to get blessed. And it ain't going to come from Satan. It's going to come from God. God is the restorer. He's the creator. He's the one that multiplies your seed sown. And if you have some seed to sow, if you can sow something uh, as, as an act of your faith towards these things that you've lost, then do it. Sow it into the kingdom of God. And, and say, Father, here's my seed. And uh, I, I believe that you're going to multiply my seed and give me back what I've lost. Okay, now let's go over to Job and let's look at 
Uh, let's see, Proverbs, Psalm, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. I'm talking to myself. Uh, let's go over to uh, Job chapter 1. Now, this might be kind of lengthy, so I'd encourage you to uh, watch every day this week and share it with your friends. Tell your friends to watch. I'm talking about restoration. Um, <clears throat> and if you miss a program, uh, then go online, vtntv.com, and um, you can pull up uh, what you've missed, the program, by date, Arkansas Live, by the date, uh, day of the week that you missed it, and you can rewatch it. Also, at the end of the program today, I'm going to show you how you can get my latest product called Ownership. Who owns the earth? The law of empowerment. And I want you to get this. Okay, let's start with uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Job. There was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and shunned evil. This, this man, Job, was a righteous man in his day. That's very important that you remember. Job lived under a different covenant than you and I live under. We live under a covenant with God through Jesus Christ and the shed blood that he shed on Calvary and that he went into the Holy of Holies, placed his blood on the mercy seat and sealed that new covenant, a new covenant. It, 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 it was a, a new order. It was a new testament uh, that was ratified by the shed blood of Jesus himself. So you got to remember that you, you can't, you can't take Job in his covenant and compare it with us in our covenant through Jesus Christ. He did not know Jesus Christ. He, he knew his mediator. He knew his intermediator lived. He said, I know my redeemer liveth. He, he just didn't know who he was or when he was going to come, but he at least knew that. You know, when I used to go to Israel with Dr. Lester Sumrall, I did six world leadership conferences with him over there in Jerusalem. And while we were uh, taping or writing and teaching people uh, the Bible and about the history of the land, he would get his camera crew and he'd go out into the desert places and he would find the nomads. The, uh, they were probably what Abraham's family looked like. Uh, they were the Arabs. They were uh, transitional. They would just pull up stakes, pull, pull down their tents, and they'd go to another place, and they'd live there a while, and then they'd come back. And uh, he went out, and he would sit with them. <clears throat> and he told me that he asked them one time, do you all believe in a Redeemer? And they all said, yes. Oh, yes, we know he's coming. Now, now these, are, these are Arabs. These are people that wear headdresses and live in tents made out of goat hides and <laughs> cattle hides very primitive. They're still living the same way that uh, uh, Abraham lived 6,000 years ago. And they're nomadic and they just move from place to place. And he would sit and talk to them and they all believed in a Redeemer. They all believed that a Redeemer was coming. Very interesting. Now, they, they didn't understand half the stuff that he talked about. Uh, they weren't religious. They weren't born again. They weren't Christians. They were Muslim and they were uh, under you know, a different uh, belief system. Well, uh, this man Job lived at a different time under a different covenant, different rules, different laws. But in his day, in his relationship with God, it said that he was a perfect, which means he was righteous, upright, one that feared God and shunned evil. And there were born unto him seven sons, three daughters. His substance was also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. He owned two-thirds of the known world, or at least a fourth of the known world at that time. Job was not poor. You, all you've heard all your religious life is poor as old Job. He wasn't poor. He owned two-thirds or a fourth of the known world at the time. He certainly was not poor. And look at, look at his, his livestock here. Look, look at 
all the possessions that he had, thousands of sheep, camels, yoke of oxen. It, it was a very great household, God said. But now listen to what happened to him. His sons went and feasted in their houses, every one this day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, now this is the first door he opens, the first indication that we have that he opened the door to what have been called Job's troubles. This is, this is how Satan was, how he gained entrance into attempting to destroy Job and his family. Job said, now when it, when it says that they, uh, they were feasting, they went and sanctified, he was talking about they were worshiping. And he said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Notice it says he did this in the, the marginal reference says all the days. So Job was making sacrifices for fear. Now we know that over in Job three, because Job said that which I greatly feared has come upon me. Let's, Go over there and read it in your Bible. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. And where it says the thing which I greatly feared, um, he's talking about um, the things that he was afraid of coming upon him, the thing which I greatly feared uh, or I was afraid of. Now, let's, let's go back and keep reading. So Job was making sacrifices for fear that his kids had sinned. Well, those kinds of sacrifices, those kinds of prayers avail nothing because they're not in faith, they're in fear. And the Lord... Uh, and, and, and excuse me, there was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? Now, sometimes when people read that, uh, they think that God... Uh, was using Job as a pawn and that God was using Job uh, to play with Satan, bargaining tool. Not so. Uh, here's, here's what the marginal reference uh, says. Uh, have you set your heart on my servant Job? In other words, when it says, have you considered my servant Job? It says, have you set your heart on my servant Job, because there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil. So get it imprinted in your mind. The relationship that Job and God had was a good relationship, a, 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 a father-son relationship, even though nobody knew God as father in those days, but he knew God as a good God. And God said, I, I love this man. He's, he's righteous. He's got a good heart. He's perfect and upright. Uh, and uh, then Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Hadn't you made a hedge about him? Verse 10. And about his house and all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands. His substance is increased in the land. Job was a rich man. And he acknowledged, even Satan acknowledged that God had built a hedge around about him and that God had prospered him. And he was a very prosperous man. And then Satan said, but if you put forth your hand, see, Satan couldn't understand. No man would serve God just because he loved him. He had to have some ulterior motive. 
He said, you've blessed it, but you put your forth hand, put forth your hand now and touch all he has. He'll curse you to your face. In other words, he's not serving you for nothing. He's getting blessed out of this. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself, put not your hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. In other words, all God did was remind him, look, you're the God of this world. At that time he was. You're the God of this world. Everything that he has is in your hand, but you cannot take his life. You cannot destroy him. Now, we're going to pick this up tomorrow. I want you to see what happened to Job in Job chapter 1, beginning with verse 13. And how he actually Job experienced a tornado himself. But I want you to see how God restored everything that he had lost. I'll tell you how to get this book. It'll help you tremendously. Watch this and I'll be right back. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. Psalm 115:16. The Lord spoke to Happy Caldwell, saying, It is not about taking back what the enemy has stolen. It is about ownership. We have to stop running after the devil to try and get back what he has stolen. This is not the focus of God's plan. In Pastor Caldwell's new book, Ownership, Who Owns the Earth? You will learn how to see yourself as sons and daughters of God with stewardship responsibilities. Learn to operate your authority as an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. God's plan is not a defensive plan, but an offensive plan. Get your copy of Ownership, Who Owns the Earth for just $12.99 plus shipping. Call the number on the screen or go online to vtntv.com to order your copy today. It was God's word to me when I started studying Job and reading Proverbs about um, stealing and restoration. He gave me this title for this book, Ownership. He said, it's not about running after the devil to get back what he's stolen. He said, it's about ownership. It's not about being on the defense. It's about taking the offense. So that's what you're going to find out. And I want you to join me tomorrow as we get further into this. Remember, we're talking about restoration. Jesus is Lord of Arkansas, and wherever in the world you're watching. Too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.